get to do this. Good afternoon and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. I'm Terry Gamble Boyer, member of the board of directors of Plowshares Fund and your moderator for today's program. Today's program is part of the club series on ethics and accountability underwritten by the Travers Family Foundation. North Korea, Pakistan, Russia, Iran. Concern over nuclear weapons continues to grab news headlines. Nine nations evidently possess nuclear weapons and at least a rudimentary means of delivering them. Today, we're honored to have two distinguished statesmen who will discuss the possible pathways to a world without nuclear weapons, as well as their outlook on the challenges facing the U.S. and global community. George P. Schultz was President Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State from 1982 to 89. He played a key role in implementing a foreign policy that led to the successful conclusion of the Cold War and the development of strong relationships between the United States, the countries of the Asia Pacific region, including China, Japan, and the ASEAN countries. Secretary Schultz also served during the Nixon administration as Secretary of Labor, Director of the Office of Management and Budget, and Secretary of the Treasury. Since 1989, he has been a distinguished fellow at Stanford's Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He is honorary chairman of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and the MIT Energy Initiative External Advisory Board, as well as the Schultz Stevenson Task Force on Energy Policy at the Hoover Institution. James E. Goodby has served as U.S. Ambassador to Finland, Vice Chairman of the U.S. Delegation to the Strategic Arms Reduction Talks, and the chief U.S. negotiator for the safe and secure dismantlement of nuclear weapons. He is currently the Annenberg Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institution. In 1994, he received the first Heinz Award in Public Policy from the Heinz Family Foundation. These gentlemen are the co-editors of the new book, The War That Must Never Be Fought, which borrows its title from President Reagan's 1984 State of the Union Address in which he declared that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. We'll hear from each of them and then have a further discussion of these issues. Please join me in welcoming Secretary George Schultz and Ambassador James Goodby. <laughs> Let me repeat. A nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. So spoke Ronald Reagan in 1984 in his State of the Union address. So spoke Ronald Reagan and General Secretary of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, in 1985 in their, after their meeting in Geneva. It's obvious. But what's not obvious is whether or not this doctrine will be observed. Let me give a little history. When I became Secretary of State, I found President Reagan a man who thought nuclear weapons were immoral. I might say at Hoover we have had evangelicals come, Catholic bishops of America come, United Religion Initiatives come, people from all religions. And you have a discussion after a while referring to people who have nuclear weapons. Somebody always said, do they think they're God? Somebody wants to press a button and kill a million people. Who are these people anyway? It's wild. So what has happened? President Reagan was convinced that nuclear weapons were immoral. And so he started a process that people thought at the time was impossible. His process was to say we should reduce them. 
eventually eliminate them, but reduce them. And <coughs> gradually, people came around to thinking, yeah, that's not a bad idea. And we met in Reykjavik with Gorbachev from the Soviet Union. By this time, the US and the Soviet Union had most of the nuclear weapons. Reagan is sitting on one of the table, Gorbachev on the other. I'm sitting beside Reagan. Shevardnadze is beside Gorbachev. We sat there for two days. We discussed everything under the sun. But we also discussed the idea of getting rid of nuclear weapons. Both Reagan and Gorbachev thought that was the right idea. We never did bring an agreement into effect, but the subject was put there on the table by the leaders of the two countries that had most of them. We also basically had put on the table without consummating it the agreements that led to the elimination of intermediate range nuclear weapons and cutting strategic weapons in half. Those were all on the table. But I thought one of the most significant things in the Reykjavik meeting was an agreement worked out on a little side deal with a wonderful woman who was my assistant secretary, Roz Ridgeway, an agreement with the Soviet Union that human rights would be a recognized regular standard subject on our agenda. We had always thought it should. The Soviets always said it's none of your business. We said it is our business. But that agreement was kind of a little extra insight into what the changes that were taking place in the Soviet Union. At any rate, <coughs> we went on and by the end of the Cold War, there was, had been created, with a lot of leadership from the United States, a lot of leadership from the United States, a security and economic commons around the world. And in that atmosphere, as the Cold War ended, we were able to see a decline in the number of nuclear weapons. And today, the number is roughly a third of what it was at the time of the Reykjavik meeting. So great progress was made in that atmosphere. What has happened? Almost suddenly, in the last decade or so, that atmosphere has switched. And we no longer have that commons. It's being attacked. And nobody is leading the charge to put the pieces back together again. And in this atmosphere, we don't have the momentum that we were granting for a decline in nuclear weapons. We have an atmosphere of proliferation. Iran wants a nuclear weapon. When they get one, if they do, Saudi Arabia will have nuclear weapons. Turkey probably wants a nuclear weapon. May Egypt probably wants one. Whether they can get them or not, I don't know. But at any rate, there's a spread going on. And the more countries there are that have nuclear weapons, the more likely it is that one or more will go off somewhere. That will be a catastrophe not only for the people immediately involved, but it sets up a global atmosphere that's very bad for everybody. <coughs> so we live in a moment of very considerable threat. And it's really important for us, I think, to try to get that atmosphere back to where we had a sense of a Security and Economic Commons. We're a long way from getting that, but get that back. And in that kind of atmosphere, it's much easier to work out arrangements to diminish the number of nuclear weapons and take steps 
that will inhibit their use. Here are two things that have happened. I want to say something positive and optimistic. One is that verification has become much more possible as time has gone on. We always thought that technical means were important and they're there. But somehow we always thought that it's important to actually observe what's taking place, on-site inspection. And way back somewhere, Ambassador Goodby was our negotiator, and he negotiated the first on-site inspection. It wasn't about nuclear things, it was about exercises, tanks, and so forth. But nevertheless, the concept that you can put your eyes on something and see for yourself was very important. That was a breakthrough in concept. And now in the New START Treaty that was signed a few years ago, we actually can go to a site and look at a warhead and count the number of warheads. It's extraordinary. So a lot of progress has been made, but beyond that, the emergence of social media of various kinds, it's extraordinary how much that has opened up everything to observation by people all over the place. It's interesting that the information about how Soviet, or I should say Russian, weaponry yeah. shot down that Malaysian airliner over Ukraine mm that everybody knew that from social media. So the powerful sunlight coming from all these new things in addition to more formal things. So that's a positive. The other positive, although it hasn't been delivered on, but it's possible, <coughs> is there's now been a series of meetings that started out in Washington, then in Seoul, then in the Netherlands, there's going to be one more that were convened by President Obama. Heads of countries came, and the idea was how to really get a hold of fissile material. And nothing really concrete that I can see has emerged from these yet, but maybe something can emerge in the next one. And beyond that, and Jim Goodby has been a very strong advocate of this for a long time, Maybe out of that we could also get people in a kind of global sense of responsibility. People look at and say, Russia and the US should do all the negotiating. Well, we have most of the weapons, but that's not enough. We have to have a global effort here. And maybe something like that can be brought out of it. So I think the picture is not very pleasant right now, but there are a few little glimmers of hope in the world. And I think the fact that we've had a good turnout here for this event shows that people have this on their mind. They understand the consequences of the use of a nuclear weapon, and we need to be working at it as best we can all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Goodby. I'll just add a, a few points to what the Secretary has said, uh, primarily to tell you what I consider the main points of this book. I hope I won't uh, save you the trouble of reading it, uh, but uh, there is a message in it, I think, and uh, I would sum it up this way. Uh, first of all, uh, we have in place a regime that was established 50 years ago almost, uh, which had to do with how you go about preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. Uh, it was a deal that uh, was between uh, what we now call the haves and the have-nots. Those countries that had nuclear weapons said that they would refrain, uh, th that they would try to de eliminate their nuclear weapons. Uh, those countries that did not have nuclear weapons said they wouldn't build them. 
time has gone on. And I think what we see happening to that regime, and by the way, when I say regime, it's well beyond the treaty itself. There is a treaty, there are a whole series of infrastructure things that are built around it, including the International Atomic Energy Agency. So the point that I want to make here is that the, that whole regime, including the treaty, in my, re in my view, is losing the sense of legitimacy that that whole idea had. And it's a very important point. Uh, legitimacy uh, means that people take something seriously. Uh, the gold standard for international agreements is a ratified treaty with legal obligations, binding obligations. If that treaty becomes suspect, if people lose faith in it, uh, then the legitimacy of that whole operation begins to weaken. Uh, and that's what I'm afraid is beginning to happen. The latest manifestation of that, by the way, is the fact that there was, during the month of May, uh, an important meeting in which all of the participants uh, in the Non-Proliferation Treaty met at, in New York, and uh, they tried to hammer out some kind of an agreement about, okay, what do we do next? How is, it, how is this treaty doing? These review meetings are held every five years. And the fact they were unable to reach an agreement at all about what to do is not unprecedented. It's happened before. But I think what we saw this time was a very, very sharp divide between the countries uh, that have nuclear weapons and those that do not. Uh, and uh, there was a sense of urgency on the part of those countries that do not have nuclear weapons that we're not moving fast enough. And they came up with all kinds of ways of just signing a document and getting rid of them that way. They rejected uh, the point that we consider it very, very important, namely, yes, you need a vision of a world without nuclear weapons, but yes, you have to move a step at a time, building confidence as you go along and gaining experience. That whole idea essentially was rejected by probably about 150 countries. And that tells you something about uh, the way the Non-Proliferation Treaty is, is now regarded. We've got to, got to do something about that in the book uh, deals with that subject. Second point is, uh, Secretary Schultz has always already mentioned this, uh, if you think about nuclear reductions as just an exercise in counting warheads and figuring out how you verify it, uh, the public at large, uh, political leaders for that matter, don't really have that much of an interest in the mechanics of all this. Instead, we have to put the nuclear reductions, the whole nuclear constraint regime, uh, into the concept of a global commons, which Secretary Schultz has mentioned, and be, he has been pushing now for a long time as a way to think about these issues. At the end of World War II, they were put in place uh, several institutions, many having to do with security and economics. Uh, as time has gone on, the, their effectiveness has eroded. Uh, just as the non-proliferation treaties effectiveness has eroded. Uh, there are a lot of issues out there that are threats to all of humanity, not just this country or that country. One of them is a nuclear holocaust. Uh, another is climate change. Uh, another is pandemics. Uh, so here you have a situation where there really aren't any effective instruments in place to deal with what are the greatest threats to, to humanity. Uh, and the point that I think is important here uh, is that an effort to build a global agreement, a global joint enterprise to create the conditions for a world without nuclear weapons could be a major ingredient of building a new global commons. I think we need to think of it that way if you think of it, of it in that context, I think it becomes immediately apparent how important this sort of thing is. So we need to get our minds around the major purposes of this, which goes well beyond that simply getting rid of a few nuclear weapons, important though that is. Uh, and third, Secretary Schultz has already mentioned this as well, uh, our current method of negotiating agreements is not really working very well. Uh, a lot of the things that the 
nuclear non-proliferation treaty depends upon uh, for action have been referred over the years uh, to something called the Committee on Disarmament, uh, which meets in Geneva and is an arm of the UN. The fact of the matter is uh, that conference or that committee has not done anything in at least 15 years. Uh, and I don't think there's any hope that it ever will. Uh, there are other committees and negotiations that go on, some bilateral. Uh, but here again, we do not have the proper instrument for dealing with something this important. Uh, and in the book you will find, especially in the last chapter, chapter 15, uh, a, not exactly a blueprint, but a series of concepts about how you can in fact use some of the models that were created uh, in this administration to deal with nuclear security, the summit meetings that Secretary Schultz was talking about. Uh, what they did was create, first of all, a summit meeting. And these meetings that we have now in place are not anywhere near that. They're basically bureaucrats who are sitting in place not doing much of anything. Not their fault, but that's the way it is. You can only do these things at the summit level. Uh, and so taking uh, a page out of the book of this nuclear security summit, Yes, there should be a nuclear security summit meeting on the subject of nuclear reductions, nuclear eliminations. Uh, and uh, I can tell you in detail about how one might go about that, but let me simply say it's not being done now. It's important that it be done. And until we get a better instrument in place to deal with other countries and they with us uh, on nuclear issues, then we won't get anywhere, regardless of the good intentions. The uh, fourth point I want to make, uh, again, Secretary Schultz has mentioned this, but uh, there are new technologies out there uh, which I think should permit us to do more uh, than we are now doing, and conceptually again. Uh, when I first got involved in some of these issues, there was a phrase called national technical means. And that was a way, it's kind of a euphemism for satellite reconnaissance that we were just getting in place at that point. Uh, and so we were able to monitor agreements through satellite reconnaissance. Uh, we did not need or did not have the capacity, is a better way of putting it, to do on-site inspection at that point. Uh, so we went to the limits of what was possible, and that meant you can monitor from uh, overhead reconnaissance the places where uh, missiles are, are launched, launchers. So you could do that, so the, uh, the measure of merit for these treaties at that point uh, was a launcher. Now, with the kinds of things that Secretary Schultz is talking about, the social media, crowdsourcing, uh, these things are in the newspapers all the time, sometimes uh, in a good uh, spirit and sometimes not. But the point is, you have a new form of national technical means now, which permits us to do a lot we were not able to do when the treaties now in place were negotiated. And we ought to be thinking about how to use those. And in the book, uh, you will find quite a lot about what we can do as matters of national policy using this new uh, technology that's available to us. There's a whole list of, in fact, it's on the last page, page 500 <laughs> <laughs> of this book. Uh, and finally, uh, whatever else we do, if we don't do anything else, we've got to stop thinking about nuclear deterrence in the same way we thought of it during the Cold War and in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War, because things have totally changed. Uh, we now have a multipolar nuclear war. It's no longer a bilateral U.S.-Soviet deal. It's a it's a place where we have, there is basically three countries uh, that operate more or less at the global uh, level, and they have interactions on the nuclear side. I'm thinking of China, Russia, and the United States. Uh, we have three regions in the world, the Middle East, South Asia, and Northeast Asia, where nuclear weapons figure in the equation between the countries in those regions. So you have an interaction now, not just between two countries, but between three countries at the global level, and regions which also add up to three. And if you want to do the multiplication, that becomes a very complex kind of set of relationships. So we have not really thought about 
uh, except to say, well, it's too bad, it's that way, but that's the way it is. And we keep applying the same old ideas that we had during the Cold War about deterrence and how it works. We really don't know now how deterrence works, except it must work in a different way than it used to. And so my final point, point number five is, and the book emphasizes this, I would say, stop thinking about deterrence as it existed in the past, because it doesn't exist that way anymore, if it ever did. Thank you. So our thanks to George Shultz, former U.S. Secretary of State and Ambassador, James Goodby, former Vice Chairman of the U.S. Delegation to the Strategic Arms Reduction Talks. Together they are editors of the new book, The War That Must Never Be Fought. And it's a good book. It's a very nuanced book. It's a very dense book, and I strongly recommend it. Uh, we have a lot of questions you that mean have- by dense? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like a comic strip. <laughs> it's Beautifully edited. <laughs> Dense in the sense of extremely rich and, and okay. very subtle. Okay, I accept. I've been thinking about this issue for some years now, and I learned a lot from this book, including, not the least of which, is, is your point to uh, deterrence and the difference between deterrence and nuclear deterrence, um, and, the, and some points you made about asymmetry, which I'd like to get to later. But first, there's some questions from the audience, and a number of questions have come in. Let me just say, yeah. deterrence has always been a very uncomfortable idea, because it only works if the person you're deterring thinks you will use mm -hmm. the weapon that's deterring. So it's a doctrine that implies use. And use is what you really can't handle, or the world can't handle. So it's never been a very comfortable concept, I don't think. And it, the implication is that it will and immediately, uh, if, upon, if you're not a first strike country, you would be able to respond immediately and effectively. One of the things in looking at Cold War history is the number of accidents that almost happened. A number of times there were false alarms and somehow people didn't bite. Instead of, when Bill Perry up here would tell about having mm -hmm. getting a call in the middle of the night from somebody at the big uh, analytical center saying there were 200 ballistic weapons headed our way, what are we gonna do? It was a false alarm. <coughs> but you, you, you have only minutes to deal with. And these things can get out of hand very easily. So we've been lucky. Mm -hmm. We can't be lucky forever. Okay. Thank you. Um, so some questions have come in about Iran. Um, one is what Where advice is do you... Iran, where is that? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Was it... Mark Twain that said that wars are God's way of teaching us geography. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said, what advice do you have for President Obama at this point in the Iran negotiations? And I would just add to that, to, this, to the point that Ambassador Goodby, Goodby made about the, um, the global comments. What, are the, what advice would you have uh, on, on the agreement? How do we defend the agreement? And if we get an agreement, what are the bigger implications of a nuclear deal with Iran for the region? I'm afraid that if we get the kind of agreement that seems to be emerging, it will be a catastrophe. Let me backtrack. <clears throat> Remember, Iran Iranians are known as rug merchants for nothing. They're good bargainers. What is their <laughs> agenda? Their agenda is to get rid of the sanctions. What should our agenda be? We look at Iran, what do we see? We see the world's leading sponsor of terrorism, some directly, some through proxies. We see a country developing a ballistic missile. Why do they want a ballistic missile? We see a country with pretty tough internal <laughs> management system. 
And we see a country that has been wanting to develop a nuclear weapon. There's no other explanation for the extensive things that they put in place. So that's what they know. So our, uh, seems to me our agenda should be to react to those things. Their agenda is get rid of sanctions. So where do our negotiations start? The only thing on the table is the nuclear program. The other things aren't even on the table. And over the years, the UN Security Council and our positions have been that the Iran should get rid of all its enrichment capability. But we managed to have the negotiation start with that agreed to. It's baffling to me how you could think that was a good, You'd have to say you're reaching out to try to get around into a negotiation. But the Iranians are very smart, they're very good bargainers, and so they take advantage of that. And so they string things along, and what do you do? You want an agreement, we'll make more concessions. So we seem to be making, bargaining seems to be, we make concessions and they want more. And I don't think we're gonna wind up with a good deal out of this. But what will happen is, if there is a deal, people in the Middle East will conclude that the United States is somehow more aligned with Iran, that Iran is gonna get a nuclear weapon. So we better get a nuclear weapon. And we can't put a lot of confidence in the United States as a country that's going to stand with us, so we have to stand for ourselves. So the whole thing begins to fall apart. And we see Iran to this day expanding its influence in the Middle East. It now has a dominant position in Damascus, quite a bit in Beirut, <coughs> in Baghdad, in Yemen. So it's not going our way. We gotta be much tougher if we're gonna negotiate. I'd send Jim Goodby in there <laughs> to be the negotiator. Wow. <laughs> Ambassador Goodby, if you were in there, what would you ask for? Uh, more, but, uh, <laughs> but the point that uh, sticks in my mind uh, is that uh, Iran is a, a major power in that region. I re remember very well, I'm sure Secretary Schultz does as well, that. Richard Nixon wanted to make Iran, under the Shah, of course, uh, one of the linchpins of U.S. security in the Middle East. It came out of something I think was called the Guam Doctrine, where the idea was we don't get involved, somebody else is our agent. And believe it or not, in the Middle East, it was Iran that was going to be our agent. So I think about that. But beyond that, uh, it really does depend uh, on what comes next. And Secretary Schultz it may very well be right that uh, it's going to be a catastrophe and probably, probably will be unless somehow or other, it's very unlikely, uh, but if it happens, there have to be some political changes uh, in Iran. And I completely agree with him about the, the way the leadership in Iran has behaved, probably still is behaving, but there is a younger generation coming along. They're, they don't have that much power, but they do have some. Uh, and here is where uh, this whole idea of empowerment of individuals through the global uh, globalization, but also communications comes into play. Uh, if you can create a situation where uh, the people in Iran, who I think would really favor a different relationship with us, if they can get some power in this situation, uh, then I'd be fairly optimistic uh, otherwise, I would agree with what the Secretary Schultz says. It's if, if, if it but continues Jim, as is. There was a moment after the Ahmadinejad corrupt election when these people you're talking about erupted. And what did we do? Nothing. We sat on our hands. So well, if people said, want to get up and protest, they got to feel there's some support somewhere. Yeah. Well, that's the point. It, it depends on what comes next, and that applies to us as well as what happens in the Middle East. 
that there is a real concern, however, about the way the Arab countries will respond to this, and, and the Secretary was right to, to say this, uh, because uh, in Saudi Arabia, of course, they are saying, well, uh, if Iran is entitled to have uh, this type of enrichment and this type of uh, reactor, uh, then we ought to be as well. Uh, and uh, that's been their, their reaction. So there is a real issue about the way the Arab countries are going to respond to this thing. It's going to take exquisite diplomacy, probably more than, uh, than we're capable of right now. Thank you. Um, before we go on to our next question, I have a reminder for the radio audience. Uh, you're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program, and our guests today are former U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz and Ambassador James Goodby, <coughs> who are discussing new approaches to eliminating nuclear weapons. You can also find video of club programs online at the club's YouTube channel. Uh, there are a number of questions about Russia, the former Soviet Union. Uh, one of them is, are you more scared about Russia today than you are about Iran? And I also would add that recently the U.S. announced uh, to that they are placing tanks and heavy artillery in NATO countries bordering Russia. On Tuesday, President Putin announced that in response, Russia is going to add 40 ICBMs to its nuclear arsenal. New start seems like a fading dream. How do we deal with Russia and President Putin going forward? Well, I think, first of all, we make a realistic analysis of what's going on. It's pretty clear, I think, that Mr. Putin wants to rearrange the way the world works and change it from a state system to a sphere of influence system. And he wants Russia to be the dominant country over a sphere of influence of the countries that used to make up the Soviet Union. He did that when he went to Georgia, put up, set up two new countries, and he's done that taking the Crimea and with the problems in Eastern Europe. That's what he wants to do. And if you say to yourself, well, what kind of cards does he hold? It probably his biggest card with these countries is the dominant position in the supply of oil and gas which he has demonstrated he is willing to cut off in the middle of winter, if need be. And he has proximity of armed forces. What are his weak points? He is playing a very weak hand, aggressively. His demography is appalling. Fertility is very low. A lot of the most creative young Russians are immigrating. Longevity for men is in 73, 74 range. That's way below most countries. I've seen numbers that say that about a third of the men die before they're age 55. They're drinking themselves to death. He has practically an open rebellion in the Caucasus. He has an economy heavily dependent on oil and gas, and the prices have tumbled. So it's a weekend. What should we do? I think we should mount, <coughs> and be clear about it, an energy initiative. We shouldn't say we can't export anything. We have the capacity to produce lots of natural gas and oil. And we should be willing, and we should work with the countries of the Eastern European area to say, we will do everything we can to see that you are supplied with oil and gas. And <clears throat> enough so that the monopoly is broken. And that the ability of the Russians to say, we'll cut off your gas in the middle of the winter and you all freeze to death, it's over. So we should take that step. And second, we need to stop degrading our armed forces and at the same time build up NATO. And that is happening. I'm very encouraged by what NATO is actually doing. So that it's clear that there's not a free hand. 
This is all very tricky stuff because you don't want it to get out of hand by accident and you start a war. On the other hand, the way to really start a war is to create a vacuum that anybody can move into <coughs> and then people feel aggrieved and they react. So I think you're much better off to show strength. I know in the Reagan period, the statement was peace through strength. We built up our strength. We were realistic in our assessments. When people said what you're asking for is unrealistic, we said this is our agenda. We're not gonna negotiate on their agenda, we negotiate on our agenda. And we, in the end, we managed to prevail. But that's the way you go about things, and I think right now with Russia, it's important to show that kind of determination. But it's also important to keep the door open and to say, <coughs> we're ready to sit down with you and talk through these issues. Because we don't want Russia to fall apart and have chaos with all these nuclear weapons around. And after all, Russia over the centuries has been a country of very productive contributions in literature and dance and history and, and science. So we want to, to the extent we can have a constructive relationship with Russia. And we should always be keeping that foot on third base and ready to do it if we can and letting them know that it's there. Yeah, I agree with every word he said, but, uh, <laughs> but let, me, let me add something. Very diplomatic. Uh, I think what we're seeing, it's important, as Secretary Schultz said, to get your analysis right. I mean, what is Russia today? What is it going through? What are its, what, where is it in history, if you will? And I see it as an empire uh, that is basically receding from its height of power. It's been doing that for a long time. Uh, today, it basically is a country that regrets it lost its empire, trying to recreate it in some economic respect primarily, uh, and not working very well. Uh, so it is not a country that people think of it as a pre-World War II or pre-World War I. No, I don't think so. Uh, it's more like when Britain and France lost their empires and they regretted it, but accomplished uh, the feat of overcoming that, and Russia has to do the same thing, and I suspect they will over time. This is also is a case where deterrence is important, but it's not nuclear deterrence. It's deterrence by denial, which is another form of deterrence, exercised primarily by other means than nuclear weapons. And what we need to do is make sure that Ukraine uh, becomes a viable country, because it hasn't been now one for quite some time. Uh, it should be a country which is more uh, able economically and politically. And if I were in charge, I would put enormous efforts into helping that country become uh, a real nation with viable institutions. That's what we should be doing, and that's a, a form of deterrence, and it will work. Uh, we need to also to be concerned about the Baltic states. Uh, the Russians are overflying those territories. They're threatening Finland. <laughs> And the worst thing of all uh, I see Putin doing right now is not so much as adding new missiles because they're still under the limits of the New START agreement by far, and they're in fact below our limits as well. But what he's doing, I think, is debasing the idea that nuclear weapons are a last resort. And he's talking about it as though it's something that one might use in the current situation involving Ukraine. And that, to me, is what's very dangerous and could get out of hand uh, and our response should not be to say, well, we're going to threaten nuclear war, too. Our response should be this kind of denial that we've been talking about. Thank you. And you have something Jim, to Jim's emphasis on Ukraine and doing everything on Ukraine is absolutely right. <coughs> but let me say, what are the main problems we need to worry about? We've talked about nuclear weapons. We've talked about climate change. Doing something about each of these issues demands a global kind of response. That's why we need an economic and security commons with people able to work together. 
The other threat is the threat to the state system. We have for a long time had a system that said there are states with boundaries and they are sovereign within these states and states work together to try to accomplish something. They vary, of course, in their ability to do that, but that's basically the system. Now, it's being attacked. On the one hand, the Putin effort is an attack. He's discarding agreements and boundaries and trying to establish a sphere of influence system. On the other hand, the ISIS states that they don't believe in countries. They believe in an ideology that crosses boundaries that in their view don't exist. It's a direct contradiction to the state system. So the state system of governance is under attack. And we need to realize what is happening and cause that to call that to people's attention, including to the Chinese attention. Thank you. And along those lines, uh, there's a question from the audience that says, beheadings and other barbaric individual killings and torture permeates the news today more than nuclear weapon killings and carnage. Does this detract from the necessary work needed to stop proliferation? And is there a real risk of ISIS, Al-Qaeda getting a nuclear weapon? <clears throat> well, you know, we ought to be able to chew gum and walk in a straight line at the same time. <laughs> Uh, that's what diplomacy is all about. Uh, I think ISIS is a, a terribly serious threat, uh, not so much because of nuclear weapons, but because of its potential for attracting uh, young men and women uh, who live in Western countries, mainly in Europe. And to me, that's a tragic and uh, almost incomprehensible thing that's happening. Uh, <clears throat> that, I think, is, is what we need to think about. How, how is it uh, that a group like this uh, is able to win the hearts and minds of, of people who are evidently alienated from living in the West and willing to go out and chop people's heads off? Uh, to me, it's a, if you will, it's a kind of ideological threat, plus their ability to manage uh, the media better than we are. Uh, so that's the kind of thing I think about. Now, uh, I think that there is enough turmoil in the uh, Middle East uh, that there's probably going to be a, uh, this kind of battle going on between various factions for quite some time, regrettably. Uh, in terms of the nuclear weapons, uh, yes, I think any country, any, any group of people like that that thinks they can acquire a nuclear weapon by buying it or stealing it, uh, probably would use it. Uh, that's the reason that it's so important for us to keep nuclear materials under control, and I think we've been doing a reasonably good job of that. But there comes a time when a country is able to buy, uh, let's say, a nuclear weapon uh, from, a, let's say, a country like Pakistan. There was a time, you remember, when the founder of the Pakistani nuclear weapons program, A.Q. Khan, was basically selling blueprints and all the ways and means of uh, building a nuclear weapon. Uh, so a lot of strange things can happen, and that conceivably could happen if, if ISIS is backed by enough funding. So it's, it's a worry there too, but I think the more immediate problem is their ability to somehow recruit, uh, and frankly outgeneral uh, people in Iraq who are trained by us, I think that's an incredible scene that we're observing, but what more can one say? I'm a Marine, <laughs> and knowing that, somebody sent me about three pages on how it is in the Marine hymn there is to the shores of Tripoli. And there was a little story about how the Barbary pilots were, pirates were taking our ships and our sailors and torturing them and doing things like ISIS is doing now. And there's a fantastic quote of the ambassador from, to Britain from Tripoli is talking with John Adams and Thomas Jefferson in 1786. And he's explaining how in their Quran it teaches them to hate us 
and they want to eliminate us, and so on. It's just right out of the same book as today. Hmm. And it's interesting, you read, that in those days, over the objections of George Washington, the Congress paid ransom to get people back. And when Thomas Jefferson became president, there was some outrageous demands, and he said, no way. We're going to beef up our Navy, so we're not just here. We can go someplace. And he put them down, and they stayed down for a while. Now they're up again. Hello, Thomas Jefferson. We need you. <laughs> Speaking of Tripoli, um, here's a question. Gaddafi gave up his nuclear program. Rogue states appear to have concluded that they need nuclear weapons to maintain power and avoid regime change in the wake of Libya. What will change their minds? Well, in the case of Gaddafi, it's not true that he gave up his nuclear program. He was trying to get nuclear weapons, and he was importing things, I think, through the AQCON network that Jim mentioned, but he didn't have them. And we knew chapter and verse about what he was doing, and he knew that. He, we, we have told him that. And he also saw that some of these people that he compared himself with, like Saddam Hussein, weren't around anymore. So he decided maybe um, he ought to do something different. But he didn't have nuclear weapons. He had a program to get them, and that program was stopped. Um, does Israel's alleged nuclear arsenal serve any advantage for peace in the Middle East? Or does it only exacerbate hostilities, or both? What was the start of that question? Does Israel's alleged opaque... For a long time, <laughs> there has been a narrative promoted by the Arab states that everything is great in the Middle East, but the only problem is Israel. What nonsense. Israel has nothing to do with the kind of turmoil that's going on in the Middle East right now. And in fact, I think if you were really trying to develop a coalition, you probably could put together Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, and Israel to work together. Not long ago, according to a source that I know is unimpeachable, a Jordanian fighter plane flew over, each, over Israel, got refueled by an American tanker, and took part in the attack on Libya and flew back again the same way. You can't imagine that happening. But that's the case. So I think the narrative is the only problem is Israel is over. And there are issues, all right. There's plenty of issues. And I think the basic issue is this, and it's a global issue. How do you govern over diversity in an age of transparency? These days, with the information revolution, people everywhere know what's going on pretty easily. And they can communicate, and they can organize, and they do. So governance has to reflect that or it won't be stable. The diversity is there and you've got to learn how to govern over it. Let me give you an example of somebody knew how. In 1969, I made my first visit to Israel. And one evening I had the luck of the draw, I don't know how, but Teddy Kollek took me over. Teddy was the iconic mayor of Jerusalem, fantastic man. And we went, all, we went for hours to one party after another in Jerusalem. Everybody having a good time, all different. And then he took me to his office. And all of a sudden, I realized I was being given instruction by Teddy. And he said, my job as mayor of Jerusalem is to make Jerusalem a beautiful picture. But it's not a painting like you think of a picture where the colors merge. My beautiful Jerusalem is a mosaic. He said, you went to all these different parties. They're all different. It's not Jews and Arabs, there are all kinds of Jewish groups, all kinds of Arab groups. And my job as mayor 
is to see it, to it that each one of them can express itself as it wants. As long as it does so in a way that doesn't inhibit somebody else from expressing themselves. And have them all glad to be, as he put it, living under the golden dome of Jerusalem. So Teddy Kollek was governing over diversity. He understood what he was trying to do. And he did make beautiful, a beautiful mosaic out of Jerusalem. <laughs> He's no longer around, I'm sorry to say, but he understood the problem. And that problem is very much so. It's in, whether you have a one-state solution or a two-state solution in Israel, it's the same problem. They have to govern over that diversity. And <clears throat> we have to do it, everybody has to do it. And people don't understand it. In the Middle East, too many regimes think that the way you govern over diversity is to kill the people you don't like. <laughs> and that, that's not gonna work too either. Let me just add to that that there, there are, is a chapter written by a retired Israeli general in this book uh, and a chapter written by an Egyptian. Uh, and you can get the opposite point of view. But the interesting thing to me about that was that the Egyptian, uh, although he had plenty of blame for Israel, he, his major worry seemed to be what he called the nuclearization of the Middle East. In other words, every country getting to the point where they were a threshold state, you know, ready to break out or actually acquiring nuclear weapons. And that he did not seem to blame so much on Israel as on the general status of what was going on in the Middle East. So take a look at those two chapters, find it there, revealing, I think. Oh, thank you. Um, here's a question about, about Asia. It says, this, except for the, uh, uh, the NPT, the nuclear, Proliferation Treaty, the U.S. seems to be focused on bilateral U.S.-Russian nuclear arms reductions. Do you think it's time to find avenues for an increase of U.S.-China discussions in this area? And what might be the political U.S. Pos position, I guess, of such a redirection? And, I, and I'm thinking also about we, the president's having trouble with a treaty in that area. What are our opportunities uh, in Asia, and what are our biggest challenges, say, in, in, in Northeast Asia? Well, the basic answer to the question is yes. Mm -hmm. We can't continue the notion that the only negotiation is U.S.-Russia. Bring China into the deal, but there are lots of other countries. Mm -hmm. And as Jim has emphasized earlier, if we can create a sense of a joint enterprise that works on this subject, then we really have a chance to get somewhere. I hope that these meetings that President Obama has initiated, the one started in Washington, then there was one in Seoul, another one in the Netherlands, and there's going to be one more. And he managed to get heads of state to come. And the idea is, what can we do about fissile material? As far as I can see so far, the results have not been uh, very uh, helpful. But maybe it can be pulled together and maybe also out of it, if it would work, the countries involved, and there are some 50, could say, all right, we need to have a sort of a joint enterprise on the nuclear subject and keep after it. That's my hope. I'm going to just add that the permanent five members of the Security Council uh, have been meeting now fairly frequently uh, and I think Rose Godamo, who is the Under Secretary of State for Arms Control, has done a very good job with that. Uh, there are limits on how much that can do, but the Permanent Five, as they call them, did submit a very interesting document to the review conference <coughs> calling on uh, countries to join them in a moratorium on nuclear testing, for example, which I thought was fairly important. And if they could do that, uh, it would make a step forward and change the dynamics at least a little bit. So. The P5 is a possibility, but we have to go well beyond that. Thank you. Jim mentioned Rose Godmiller. She's our main negotiator. And <clears throat> maybe the Commonwealth Club could get her to come and talk. She is terrific. If she comes, come and listen. You'll learn something. So we only have a few minutes left, unfortunately, because I know we could talk about this for a lot longer. Um, but I want to ask Secretary Schultz, because uh, serving under President Reagan, you saw the nuclear weapons freeze and similar movements. 
occurring uh, back in the 80s. How can citizens, NGOs, foundations, I'm on the board of the Plowshares Fund, how can we contribute toward working toward a world free of nuclear weapons? Well, I think, first of all, there's continued advocacy and the bringing to people's attention that the use of a nuclear weapon is a catastrophe. During the Cold War, it was kind of up there in people's consciousness, and it's come down. It was interesting <coughs> to me, do you remember the Chernobyl accident in the Soviet Union? I was fascinated when the first meeting I had with Gorbachev <coughs> after that accident, I found that he had asked for the same calculation I had asked. I'd asked our experts to tell me, what is the relationship between the damage done at Chernobyl, which was terrific, and what would have happened there if it had been a nuclear weapon? Answer, it's not even close. A nuclear weapon is so much more damaging. So that was kind of a reality check for Gorbachev and for everybody to see. And so I think that we need to keep this awareness alive that these things are not little playthings. They can destroy humanity. And then it seems to me we need to keep alive the things that can be done in a kind of technical way to deal with them. But then we have to work on the environment. It was really the unwinding of the Cold War against a background of the economic and security commons that the US had done a lot to build that brought about this huge reduction. As I said earlier, the nuclear weapons today are about a third of what they were at the time of the Reykjavik meeting. That atmosphere made a huge difference. Right now, the atmosphere in the world is terrible. Well, we've got to restore something that is, uh, gives you a greater sense of stability and reasonable outlook. So I think we also, one of the <coughs> things, I know, I'm a Reagan guy, and Reagan was very clear. He thought nuclear weapons were bad. And he was also a guy who somehow knew how to get something to happen. And he lucked into having Gorbachev arrive. On the other hand, the tensions had already started to ease by the time Gorbachev came along. And that was due to a tough battle, but a willingness to follow through. We deployed INF weapons in late 83 in response to the Soviet SS-20 weapons. The Soviets walked out of arms control negotiations and fanned war talk. And we and our allies stood our ground. And we made a coordinated set of statements. President Reagan made a sort of high level moderating statement and I did one more operational and had a meeting with Gromyko, which was at least civil. And then gradually over the months, things have gradually sort of settled down because strength had been exhibited. And by August of 1984, I was able to go to the president and say, Mr. President, at four of our diplomatic or cities where we have diplomats in Europe, a Soviet diplomat has come up to one of ours and said virtually the same thing. Namely, that if Gromyko is invited to Washington when he comes to the General Assembly, he would accept. In other words, the Soviets blinked. And I said to President Reagan, mate, you want to think this over because Jimmy Carter canceled these visits when they invaded Afghanistan and they're still there. Hmm. And he said, I don't have to think it over. Let's get them here. So we did a little <coughs> diplomatic minuet and Gromyko came and that was the sort of a hinge point. There was one little funny, th fun thing that happened. Just a little surge on the side. One of my pals was Nancy Reagan. And Nancy and I talked over this thing, and I said to her, 
what's going to happen is Gomiko comes to the West Wing, goes into the Oval Office. We have a meeting. Then we walk down the colonnade to the mansion. There's some stand around time. And then there's a working lunch. But this is your home. So why don't you be there as the hostess in the stand around time? So she liked that. So she was there. And Gromyko came. He was a smart diplomat, spoke English, been around. He saw Nancy Reagan there. He made a beeline for her. Nobody else was in the room as far as he was concerned. So they talk a little bit. And then all of a sudden, he says, does your husband want peace? And Nancy, no, Nancy could bristle. She said, of course my husband wants peace. And then Gromyko says, well, every night before he goes to sleep, whispered his ear, peace. <laughs> and then he was a little he was a little taller than Nancy, so she put her hand on his shoulders and he pulled him down so he had to bend his knees a little. And she said, I'll whisper it in your ear, peace. Ah, oh, <laughs> fantastic. Well that's a great note on which to end. Thank you. Our our thanks to George yeah. Schultz, former U.S. Secretary of State and Ambassador James Goodby, former Vice Chairman of the U.S. Delegation to the Strategic Arms Reduction Talks. Together, they are editors of the new book, The War That Must Never Be Fought. We also thank our audiences here. He has a dinner engagement. All, we also thank our audiences here and on radio, television, and the internet. Tonight's program has been part of the club series on ethics and accountability underwritten by the Travers Family Foundation. I'm Terry Gamble Boyer, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, <laughs> the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>